Hey guys, it's Slave to the Games, and we're gonna be going over the Bano Hakim. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that right. At least that's how it is shown to be pronounced on the White Wolf Wikipedia. So we're gonna be using that. Thank you guys for stopping by, and I hope you enjoy the video. The Bano Hakim, sometimes known ignorantly or despairingly as Asamites, are one of the 13 vampire clans of the World of Darkness. Based in their hidden fortress Alama in the Middle East, they are traditionally seen by the Western kindred as dangerous assassins and diablerists. But in truth, they are guardians, warriors, and and scholars who seek to distance themselves from the Jihad. Throughout their history, they have remained a self-sufficient and independent clan, although they have recently joined the Camarilla. Due to their inherent clan weakness, Banu Hakim grow darker with age. From the beginning, the Banu Hakim were an isolated lot, centered around Alama in the Middle East. Lacking the competition for certain roles due to the relative absence of other clans, the clan thus maintained its separation of duties over the millennia rather than becoming specialized to one particular mode of existence. The viziers tended to the mortal herds, the judges, now the warriors, tended to the clan's defense, and the sorcerers pursued their secrets. This division of labor allowed the Bano Hakim to succeed on their own, where a clan priding itself on its specialization, such as the Noble Ventru or the Socialite Tordor, would have failed. They associated rarely with other canines, notably lending assistance to the Salubri during the Bali Wars and paying homage to the Bruja city of Carthage. This was in no small place, attributed to the presence of the Antediluvian himself, who saw the squabbling over territory and mortal herds as reminders of the ill-fated second city, and tried to withdraw himself and his brood as well as he could. Nevertheless, small cabals supported various mortal nations, entangling themselves within the Jihad, and this enraged their founder so greatly that he left Alamut, occasionally visiting it, but never staying for long, until he disappeared completely. The rise of Western civilization brought the children of Hakim into close contact with the rest of the Canaanite world again. During the time of the Greek city-states and the height of Persian dominance, few clans other than the Bruja, Ravnos, Sedites, and then the one clan that I can never ever pronounce right, no matter how many different ways to look up how to pronounce it, the Tismazi, had enjoyed more than sporadic encounters with the children. However, as Rome expanded and later as Byzantium rose, those kingdom's Canite parasites moved with them, struggling in vain to control the first moral institutions that were more complex than they could comprehend. The children of Hakim never had an extensive role in the Roman Empire's life or death. Scattered members of all three castes moved through Roman society, particularly in the eastern and southern regions of the empire, and no few warriors found mercenary employment as bodyguards or household troop commanders for wealthy Ventru and Malkavians. After the destruction of Carthage and the growing expansion of the empire into the Middle East, however, most Banu Hakim abandoned the city in its festering web. Rome was never a place of particular interest for the children, but the Parthian Empire began to become one, arising in Persia a century before Rome's ascent began. Parthia spread through the Mesopotamian region in the wake of the crumbling Seleucid dynasty. Many children encouraged the Parthian expansion, save for those who had maintained close ties to the Seleucids. Some saw Parthia as a rich ground on which to sate their particular hungers, whether for vide, battle, or learning, while others simply welcomed an end to the chaotic infighting that surrounded their homes. Following the destruction of Carthage and the subsequent Roman expansion west, Parthia quickly became all too significant to the children as the force holding the Roman Canaanites at bay. All three castes devoted themselves to reinforcing the mortals who could fend off their undead adversaries. The Banu Hakim of the Dark Ages are strongly unified, following a tumultuous period where the clan was split by those who followed Islam and those who chose not to. Some Banu Hakim even renounced their clan membership, becoming dispossessed. It took the threat of the Bali destroying the clan entirely for them to come together again. In 636 CE, the demon worshippers had once again reformed and the Banu Hakim were ready to strike them down. It was during their siege on the tainted Acropolis of Chorazin that the Bali unleashed their curse of hunger upon the warriors, arising in insatiable thirst for Vitae within them. Neone and Methusula alike fell prey to a dreadful hunger that could be satisfied only by the Vitae of other Canaanites. As the curse spread across the cast, the sorcerers and viziers searched in vain for a way to break it. By the end of the 14th century, the entire warrior caste and no few sorcerers and viziers were afflicted. The vast majority of the Banu Hakim became Muslim, 
but some still followed other faiths. In the Dark Ages, the children of Hakim are kept quite busy because of the Western vampire clans. The Crusades enabled the Western Canaanites to invade the lands of the Banu Hakim. In addition, their greedy and corrupting ways had hurt and diminished the herds the Banu Hakim had so carefully developed and tended to, as well as the mortal families of the assassins that many of the clans still held in some regard. In response, the Banu Hakim worked to rid themselves of these invaders and restore their own power. For centuries, the children of Hakim also refused to officially embrace women, although this policy seems to have changed by the time of the War of Princes. Another split had taken by this time, that of the creation of the three castes, warrior, vizier, and sorcerers. Although the Banu Hakim considered themselves noble, the western vampires saw them as little more than meddling, corrupt, heretic foreigners and placed them among the low clans. As a side note guys, instead of putting this in another video, I'm gonna just throw it in right here. The War of Princes is the period of conflict in Canaanite history that began shortly after the fall of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade in 1204 CE. The term refers to the conflicts over territory that the various princes in Europe fought after the end of the Long Night. The War of Princes began shortly before the Inquisition was formed, although the Inquisition Inquisitors were initially used as tools by the elders, they soon became a greater threat to the Canaanites than the Canaanites were to another. Although it is not clear exactly when the War of Princes ended, it would have likely been forced to a conclusion with the advent of the Anarch Revolt, if not sooner. The clan called themselves the Banu Hakim, or Children of Hakim, especially in the Middle East and North Africa. Superior in numbers to the other Bait in the area, many of the Banu Hakim worked hand in hand with the Shira to keep the Europeans out, especially since the majority of the clan was Muslim. The Inquisition never really touched the Holy Land, nor did it extend into the Ottoman Empire or parts farther east. While the Asimites regained their strength from the battles of the Crusades and the aftershock of the Bali Curse, the European elders sacrificed their childer for the hope of another knight's survival. Too many of those intended victims fled east, preferring to take their chances with the dread Sarakans than with their sire's betrayals and the church's flame slate crosses. When the sentiments among the childer boiled up and the Anarch Revolt began, the Banu Hakim followed slaying many Canaanites and gaining the reputation as a clan of cannibalistic assassins and murderers, a sentiment that many warriors encouraged to flourish. When the Camarilla was founded, many Anarchs chose to ally with them instead of continuing their struggles. This enraged many children operating in Europe who saw their erstwhile allies deserting them for the promise of sanctuary that they could have earned for themselves anyway if they had possessed the strength to continue their fight. They turned their attention to the Camarilla with a fury born of betrayal. It was only after a lone Nosferatu discovered the location of Alamut that the Banu Hakim yielded and submitted to the Treaty of Tyre and the blood curse of the Tremere. In the eyes of many Canaanites, however, the Asimite threat was barely contained. This showed itself when the Ottomans marched against the rest of Europe and the Asimites followed the Turks, hoping to direct them against Vienna to smite the Inner Council of Seven and force them to rescind the curse. The viziers and sorcerers hid themselves in Alamut and began to work furiously to break the curse on their own, using alchemic potions made of vide to stimulate the effects of diablery. In order to obtain this blood, many warriors were forced to sell themselves as assassins, further strengthening the picture of the fanatic killer. Many warriors began to invent stories over their clan and Hakim, further concealing the other two castes. The Asmites did not fare well during the Victorian Age, still suffering the effects of the curse leveled upon them by the Tremere after the Convention of Thorns and the Treaty of Tyr, the Banu Hakim presence in the larger Canaanite community was negligible. Most Banu Hakim stayed on or near Alamut, husbanding their strength the day when they could travel with impunity through the lands of the Brood of Cain once again. European colonialism had little direct effect on the assassins themselves, but resulted in a significant portions of their mortal herd being dominated by one western power or another. Egypt in particular was hit hard when the British assumed control. The sole good thing to come from the Victorian era imperialism was that disquieted fanatic humans with a motivation to study the arts of killing were easy to find and recruit. At least the Banu Hakim always had the Ravnos to look down upon, for that clan weathered the Victorian age even worse than the childer of Hakim, subjects as they were to British domination of India. The awakening of Ur Shalgi, one of the first sorcerers in Chalde of Hakim himself, brought rapid changes on the clan as a whole. The ancient Methuselah used his tremendous power to break the curse laid upon the clan, succeeding where other sorcerers had worked for hundreds of years without success. His harsh views and interpretations of the laws of Hakim, however, triggered various struggles and discomforts, especially with his own Chalde al-Ashrat, which resulted in what is commonly called the Schism. 
The Esmite castes split apart during the schism. Ur Shulgi demanded that other Banu Hakim give up the worship of other gods and only revere Hakim. This resulted in many assassins being killed, and many more opting to leave Alamut. Ur Shulgi was particularly vicious towards Muslim assassins and killed several elders for refusing to renounce their faith, including Jamal, the head of the warrior caste. Some Banu Hakim joined the Camarilla. Most of those that joined the Camarilla were viziers and sorcerers. Warriors that join the Camarilla are generally seen as loose cannons who must be supervised by their more restrained and not vide addicted clanmates. Sorcerers in the Camarilla find their skills in high demand as an alternative to dealing with the Tremere. A small number of the clan, mostly warriors, join the Sabbat. While the Banu Hakim and Tichibu, who had been with the Sabbat for the last 500 years, were entirely from warrior stock, the warriors opting to join the Sabbat were not entirely welcomed with open arms. Many of the Aslamite and Tichibu elders, particularly in the Black Hand, had defected and left the Sabbat to Turn the, to the main clan. This meant the Sabbat was not entirely welcoming because of the recent betrayal. Few sorcerers or viziers joined the Sabbat. Some Banu Hakim chose to go completely independent and avoid all the sects. They also drew away from the main clan, primarily for religious reasons. Few warriors chose this option. Most dispossessed are viziers or sorcerers. Many Asmites stayed with the main clan. Most of these were warriors and sorcerers. Most Banu Hakim on the Path of Blood chose to stay with the main clan as well. The Ashira have formed an alliance with the Camarilla out of a common interest in thwarting the Sabbath's aggression in the region. As a diplomatic outcome of the alliance, Clan Banu Hakim, formerly the Asmites, have been admitted as a member clan of the Camarilla. These nights, the clan's global role has changed. The Banu Hakim, who worship Ur Shulgi and have turned their back on Islam, still practice internal clan rituals relating to the sampling and storing of kindred vide. Rumors of mass diablery fuel the fear that the clan wants nothing less than the end of all their kind. These loyalists hidden in the fortress of Alamut have driven more than half of the clan to break their bonds to their blood-soaked past. In doing so, they have attracted the attention of our sect. The Banu Hakim are once more seen as a potential pillar of the Ivory Tower. Camarilla sworn Banu Hakim groom sectors of our domains, specifically gaining the influence over the kind involved in law and the breaking of it. The Islamic Banu Hakim, steadfastly keeping themselves outside the influence of the Ur Shulgi, are known as loyal Ashira champions and as Western and Eastern kindred find common enemies in Sabbat and Anarch uprisings, the idea of the Camarilla seeking an alliance with the Clan of the Hunt seems more and more reasonable. The children of Hakim have ever claimed their founder was the judge of all vampires. Within the Camarilla, they maintain his legacy, claiming herds and retainers within police departments, security forces, and border patrols. They also hold dominion over segments of organized crime. The clan grooms kind within these sectors, some for the embrace, some for services, but mainly to hold a valuable card in Camarilla cities. When the other clans want a problematic moral shut up, the Banu Hakim exert the law's grasp via the kind. Until recent events, the main clan was strongly unified, based on their ancestral home base Alamut. Traditionally headed by the eldest and supported by the Dua, the clan focused inward, sending its assassins out to gather blood for the alchemic potions the experiments of the sorcerers needed to break the blood curse, as I've mentioned before. The Council of Scrolls was responsible for introducing new technology into the clan and investigating recent developments outside of Alamut, while the Council of Dua formulated clan policy and was composed of the representatives of each caste. This was the Caliph for the Warrior's Cast, the Amur for the Sorcerer's Cast, and the Vizier for the Vizier's Cast. The protection of the Eldest and the Duat Council lay in the hands of the Silsila. Apart from that, the Asmites have never formally defined any positions. However, the Warriors have evolved a series of ranks that represent an individual's standing within the cast, and the Sorcerers and Viziers have cooperatively maintained an academic and professional ranking scheme for centuries, like the Fidai, the Rafiq, the Dai, and the Isis. On the other hand, the scholars of the clan have their own hierarchy. These lesser officers are the aspirants, the associates, the masters, the distinguished masters, the full masters, and the emeritus. Now, normally this is the point where I'd go over the clan variants for everyone, but I'm not going to do that because while it may look like there's a lot of information on it by looking at the pages or anything, it's not something I haven't gone over at all already, except for the fact that there is two we didn't talk about, which is the Bedouin and the Quarters. So I'm going to explain these two. The Bedouins are a small nomadic bloodline of the warrior caste native to North Africa. Africa that practices animalism and makes extensive use of ghoul predators and warhorses to maintain their dominion over the thinly populated wastelands that they call home. They come primarily from mortal Bedouin and Berber stock. These individuals hold no sectarian allegiance and are only nominally 
loyal to Alamut, preferring to be left alone. The courtiers began with a group from the Vizier caste who involved themselves in Byzantine politics during the heyday of that empire and came to favor presence over celerity, a preference that passed on to their descendants. About two dozen members of the bloodline currently exist, most of whom reside in the Middle East, pursuing their own agendas among the Ashira. As a whole, the children of Hakim hold themselves apart from the political squabbles of other Canaanites. This is due in part to geography, at least before the advent of mechanized transportation but mainly to a subtle sense of superiority. The children like to feel that they have no need to resort to politics to achieve their aims. This is not to say that no member of the line is incapable of subtlety. Indeed, many viziers have achieved great success in the political arena, but rather that the clan culture, such as it is, is predisposed toward more direct solutions. Of course, this political isolation has also had its drawbacks. Absent from the intrigues of the damned means lack of enemies, but also of allies, which resulted in the isolated state of the clan after the formation of the Camarilla. Also, most Asamites are inexperienced in the games of power and prestation other kindred have played for millenniums. Asamites are divided into three castes, which often have a semi-antagonistic relationship with each other. While Asamites grow dark with age, have access to Quidus as a clan discipline, and have a weakness related to some form of lust so powerful that it stains their aura, the different castes also have different disciplines and weaknesses. The castes are all hereditary. That is, a warrior Asamite will always sire warrior cast childer and never sorcerers or viziers. Despite this, the three castes are considered equally close to the antediluvian Hakim, who is said to have sired Asmites of all three types in the second city. Among themselves, Asmites use the tradition of the Daiwankwana from Kurdistan to settle in the last few hours before the sun rises, exchanging news and discussing events that affect them to form the sense of community. Outsiders are not welcome and to be invited to a Daiwankwana is a sign of great respect. The clan tends to watch potential neonates before allowing an Asamite to sire progeny. Although necessity sometimes demands that a new child aid be sired quickly, the Asamites prefer making time for an apprenticeship. The Asamite and Teacher Bue are strict in choosing recruits. If a newly created Asamite and Teacher Bue survives his first experience in combat, he becomes a must job or deserving one. Mortals never serve the Asamites before being chosen to become one. Only after becoming vampires do they get the chance for acceptance. For a period of seven years, the vampire must serve the Asamite and teach me who created him. If the Mustajib fails in any of his tasks, he is destroyed. If he succeeds, he becomes a Fadias, one who sacrificed himself. For seven more years as he serves his creator. Asamites typically choose people with somewhat obsessive personalities for the embrace, as they are typically involved with either hunting down miscreants or conducting obscure research, they tend to be highly motivated individuals. This often results in Asmites picking individuals who are fanatically devoted to a cause, religion, theory, or activity. The various caste flaws and the training they undergo after the embrace tends to accentuate this even more. Thus, Asmites can be said to select childhood that will be eager to chase down their prey no matter how long it takes or how far they must go. That prey may be a physical target, an obscure piece of knowledge, or even pursuing the perfection of an art form. The Asmites draw most of their childer from the Middle East, North Africa, and surrounding areas, but this does not mean they are all Arab. They also embrace childer from the Indian subcontinent, Persians, Turks, Malays, Central Asia groups such as the Uzbeks and Kazakhs, and various Mediterranean groups. Asmites from European or Far Eastern ethnic groups are not unheard of, but are uncommon. When thinking of the Asmites, most other vampires assume they will be Muslim. While they do draw the majority of their childhood from the Middle East and other Muslim countries, this does not mean all Asmites are Muslims. While most are, and some Asmites from pre-Islamic times converted, it is not considered the official Asmite religion by any stretch of the imagination. Many elder Asmites come from pre-Islamic cultures practicing some form of animism or ancestor worship. Some are Jews, Christians, or Zoroastrians as they were also common in the area before the coming of Islam, and are still present in the modern era, though to a lesser extent. Virtually any religious background is acceptable for an Asamite. Being a Muslim is just most likely. Asamites tend to embrace more men than women overall, and in the first edition sources, it was even indicated that they did not embrace women at all until roughly 200 years ago. Later editions apparently refuted this. They still tend to embrace more men than women. The exact ratios have varied with time and depend on the cast, so this is definitely a source to be debated. Warriors typically embrace far more men than women, and may be the source of the rumor that the Asamites actually banned embracing women. Women are less likely to have the skills that warriors favor. They also tend to be physically smaller and less aggressive than men. 
That they were typically married off young and were raising children also limited the number of embraced as warriors. Female warriors thus tend to have unusual skills or backgrounds that lead to their embrace. Some may have disguised themselves as men to fight, be skilled with more subtle means of assassination, such as poison, or less physical aspects of warfare, such as diplomacy. Viziers and sorcerers are less focused on the physical skills of their childer and thus more likely to embrace women. The number of women embraced waxed and waned based on the overall attitude towards educating women. In periods where women were rarely taught to read or write, they naturally took fewer women. However, even in periods where few people were educated, a vizier might take someone for their skill with art or social acumen, even if they were a total illiterate. Similarly, a sorcerer might embrace someone who showed some innate knack for magic, even if they could not write their own name. Childer could be taught to read and write after the embrace, after all. Men typically had a head start on education, however, making them a more likely choice. Age-wise, embraces were also skewed by caste. With their emphasis on physical pursuits, Asmite warriors typically favor the young and fit. Thus, most warriors with an older physical appearance were probably embraced for their skills with leadership or tactics, rather than raw physical might. Older warriors may also have been embraced for skill in an area that takes a lifetime to master, such as blacksmithing, constructing siege weapons, or more obscure weapons and fighting styles. It is unlikely that a warrior would embrace anyone with a severe physical problem. Alrighty then guys, that's the end of this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it and learned something new. If you did, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe as always. And then optionally, think about joining my Discord to chat with me if you don't want to use YouTube, which you could still use YouTube and I'll still reply to. Or think about joining my, well, Patreon to help further support me and what I do. And then also check out the merch store if you want as well. Anyways guys, it's been fun. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll catch you guys in the next release tomorrow.